Okay, let's get going. So welcome to uh, to the uh, OAuth interim. Um, so this is the not well. Um, a, a reminder: this applies here. So uh, before we get going, logistics. Uh, uh, please add your name to that list of attendee list, and make sure to add your name and affiliation. Uh, queue management. Um, if you want to speak up and say something, please add uh, um, add your uh, your name or just add a, a plus Q to to the chat. And if you didn't have, if you decided that you don't want to talk anymore, just a minus Q to help um, uh, with the people that taking notes know who's speaking and and make sure we have a, a, an order, right? Um, Today we will be talking uh, about uh, OAuth 2.1. That Aaron will uh, will run through through this one. I just want to um, uh, mention that we we have added one more meeting in November, and this is to talk about token exchange profile for enterprise. Um, uh, Kelly will be talking about this. They they sent an email to the list um, uh, a while back. Uh, we didn't see any response or any feedback on that. So when I give them a chance to to talk about this and and um, maybe get some feedback uh, from from the uh, from the team here. Um, so that's that's uh, all I have uh, for this. Uh, any questions? Any comments? Okay. Thank you. Let me I'll stop sharing and let Aaron take it from there. Aaron, it's yours. All right, let me find the application to share. Uh, is that working? Yes. Okay, great. That's doesn't show it on my end. Um, cool. Thanks everybody for joining. So, um, OAuth two point one. Uh, topic of today, I'm going to go through the uh, summary of the changes and talk about, of, uh, we flagged a few issues to discuss um, today, which we're hoping to make some progress on and um, come to a consensus on. So draft four, we published last week and um, at the last meeting, uh, at last interim meeting was draft two. So we've actually uh, done two revisions since then. Uh, basically, a summary of the changes since last time. Um, a lot of it has been some sort of minor uh, minor edits, like um, fixing some examples and typos and editorial stuff. Um, thanks to everybody who contributed to that on GitHub. We've merged a few pull requests uh, to take care of some of that as well. Um, one of the big changes was uh, a, a big restructuring of the draft to move all of the um, everything about what's sent to the token endpoint is in a section. So that's like all of the the, the grant types are defined um, as like a token endpoint section. So section four is all about what are you sending to the token endpoint and what are the grant types ex how they extend the sort of base request. Um, that's a big change compared to the structure of of uh, OAuth 2. So hopefully that is clearer and easier to sort of see the, the similarities and the patterns there and how to extend it. Um, one of the other pieces was moving some of the um, normative text from security considerations, which uh, was a combination of the security considerations, both in the base document as well as in the security BCP. So there are some normative things in there that are now better integrated in line in the doc where it makes more sense uh, that you would be expected to see normative text. Um, there was uh, one comment brought up about this uh, sending access tokens and query strings. So that is not allowed according to the security BCP. So then instead of actually omitting it in OAuth 2.1, we actually said not to do it explicitly. Just because that one we felt like was a big enough uh, red flag to to mention explicitly. Um, so those are the sort of major changes in the draft. 
Um, we are planning a few changes that are just not yet done. I'm still working through the feedback from Justin and Vittorio from a while back. Um, those were very thorough. Thank you all for that. And uh, the stuff that's left is the stuff that was referencing sections eight through above, which are now getting into mainly the security considerations and things like that. So um, hopefully that part will go faster. And there is still some normative language left in the security considerations section. So there's still more work to do there. Um, that is an ongoing thing. And as we discussed um, at the last interim meeting, uh, mentioning non-normatively about the removal of the implicit flow. So that one is one of the ones I want to talk about uh, first here, since we actually have some proposed text to resolve that. Uh, I guess I can, uh, I don't see anybody in the chat, but if anybody has any questions at this point, I'll pause before I continue on to the uh, bulk of the issues they wanted to talk about today. Okay. Um, well, the first one I wanted to discuss is resolving the, the mentioning of the implicit flow. So this is, um, this is what we came up with. Uh, the idea here is to uh, rather than just completely not mention implicit in the draft, which is the, the current stand, um, actually explain a little bit more context for people so that they understand a little bit more about the reasons that it's not in the draft. So the security BCP does a very thorough job of, of mentioning all the issues with it. And we actually don't have most of that text in here because it's not in 2.1 to begin with. So we wanted to clarify a little bit more about the context of that. The proposal here is to add this uh, section, this new section to section 10. Section 10 is um, the, the section called differences from OAuth 2. So it's meant to be a, a sort of summary of, of a situation and it's not normative, it's just sort of explaining the context. So um, this paragraph, uh, explains that the implicit grant is omitted from 2.1 since it was deprecated in the security BCP, um, but specifically because the, I, the, the goal was to stop issuing access tokens from the authorization endpoint. So basically it means the tokens are always issued from the token endpoint now. Um, the sentence at the bottom um, is explicitly saying that by removing response type token, it doesn't affect other extensions. And it's not intended to block other things like response type ID token, which is technically the implicit flow also because a token is returned from the authorization endpoint, but we're explicitly talking about removing, uh, stopping issuing access tokens from the authorization endpoint. So the goal here is just to be very clear about not uh, removing the implicit flow is actually removing access tokens from the authorization endpoint and any, any other extensions are free to, you know, still do things that are not that. So um, hopefully that will clear up some of the questions that developers have about how OAuth 2.1 affects uh, OpenID Connect. So that's this. Um, this is sitting in a PR ready to be merged. So um, I just wanted to get a sense of the group's feeling on this and um, go ahead with that if everyone's okay with it. Yeah, if, if somebody has any comments or questions, uh, please add yourself to the queue. I'm seeing in the yep. chat, Good. Um, Brian says this seems okay. Yep. Vittorio says fantastic update and Justin says looks great. Yep. Sounds good. Wonderful. Keep going then. Okay. <laughs> Um, the next one, 46, um, this is about the ISS response parameter. I think we had flagged this um, at the last interim. I don't remember how much we had talked about it, but because this is being added into the security BCP, we would like to also add this into OAuth 2.1. Um, realizing that this is relatively late uh, or relatively new thing to be adding when most of OAuth 2.1 is not adding any of the sort of newer things. 
Um, the reason for adding this is that it is a uh, relatively small addition. It's not required by everybody. It's only required if you're if your clients are interacting with multiple ASs and it is a pretty cleanly uh, documented and cleanly described solution to a very small specific problem. So um, it's not adding uh, it's not adding a huge new chunk of work. Um, so hopefully that is a small enough scope that it makes sense to add it to the base to the to the core uh, talk. Um, so yeah, anybody have any thoughts on this one? So I oppose doing this. It expands the charter of what this draft was supposed to do, which was simply profiling OAuth 2.0 um, to a subset that we wanted to have move forward. Um, we should not be adding functionality to the draft of any kind. Okay, the reason the reasoning was um, because it is part of the security BCP, which was a big chunk of what goes into OAuth 2.1. That was the reason for, um, for proposing it. Yeah, I understand, but the whole premise of doing this draft is it was an OAuth 2 subset. Now you're adding new functionality, which means it's no longer an OAuth 2 subset. We should not do this. If I could clarify. Yeah, go ahead, David. Um, this was to capture all of the <laughs> OAuth 2 and extensions and uh, best current practices, Mike. It wasn't just a subset. And so if we consider adding um, ISS as a best current practice, then it fits within the charter. If we think it's new functionality, then it doesn't. But I don't think it it's actually functionality. adds new functionality. The goal of adding ISS is as a security best current practice. Yeah, I understand that, but it's new functionality. Well, I don't think it actually provides new functionality. I think it provides additional security. The, 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 the signal doesn't change how anything responds except for being able to be used from a security point of view. Yeah, I understand. I know what it's for. I wrote about it in the uh, mix up attack like four years ago. Uh, that said, there are no OAuth 2 deployments that do this. So we shouldn't be describing this here. There is a new draft that is trying to standardize this, which I support. But we shouldn't be mixing it into an OAuth 2 profile. I would uh, like to this, recommend this that as well. This is a new development. So first of all, may I? Go ahead, Thorsten. Sorry. Thank Go you. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, Mike, um, there are existing deployments that, that use that functionality, as it is um, recommended in the security BCP. And um, we did not charter um, to OAuth two point one draft as being just a profile of OAuth two, as uh, Dick pointed out. It was supposed to, in the end, build a new baseline for developers consolidating all the BCPs that we have around OAuth 2.0. And I personally would not add the issuer to OAuth 2.1 if I would not believe that's a very, it's an important security function. So if we do not add that to OAuth 2.1, what's the alternative? And by the way, we also added Pixie to OAuth 2.1, which was not an OAuth 2.0 original feature, it was an additional draft. Sure, but that's a completed RFC. That's a different thing. This is not in any completed RFC. So, so just like just to give an update. So this this draft is ready to go to the ISG. So it's gonna I'm gonna ship it to the ISG this week. So it's getting close to being RFC. Hopefully, would that would that help, uh, Mike? In in your mind? Not a lot. I mean, this is, we're 
adding things to OAuth 2 at this point, which we were not supposed to be doing. We have already likewise, sorry, this is Philip Skokan from Out0. Uh, we have likewise added the requirement to support and require Pixie, which was not OAuth 2.0 when it shipped. I, I, I see this as exactly the, 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 you know, exactly the same. We added Pixie to improve security. ISS does the same. Yeah, I understand. Pixie's been around for four or five years. This is completely new. Right. So, Mike, what about if we make it conditional on it being accepted as an RFC? It's already in deployments. Yeah, it seems that our fleet ships this already. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit better, but. You know, I, I just worry that we're open to feature creep and this is an example. This is not what this is supposed to be. I, I fully agree with you on feature creep. This seems to me to be more of a security consideration as opposed to a new feature. Like Pixie. Yeah, I've, I've said my piece. I don't want to take up more of our time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I Thank appreciate you. you wanting to ensure we're not getting uh, scope creep. Yep. Okay. And just to clarify, okay. also, this is not a thing that would be required for every OAuth server. It's only it's only uh, necessary in you know specific circumstances. So it's not like we would expect every OAuth server to have to suddenly add this feature. What's the language proposed in the spec to make that clear? Um, well, it's in the ISS, it's in the spec that describes ISS, but it's, I believe, scope to if your client interacts with multiple authorization servers. Yeah. Because if it doesn't, then there is no need for it. Is it a should or a must, Aaron? I'm actually not sure about that. Orsten, do you know? I, I do agree that scoping it to where it actually adds value is better than just saying and always send this parameter. I mean, part of what I would want to see also, as long as we're getting into it, is having the kind of conditional language where if you're already sending an ISS, as part of your ID token, you don't need to do this. Yeah, I know that's mixing layers, but in practice, if you're using connect, you're already getting the ISS. I thought that the draft mentions that, right? Um, Justin, you're in the queue, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that we keep coming back to this refrain of if you're solving this in a different way, then you don't need to do this. Specifically, if you're doing connect, you don't need to do these extra 2.1 things. And uh, that that may be well and good, but I think we're spending an inordinate amount of time discussing the uh, existing workarounds uh, that are built into connect. It's um, not a workaround, it's core functionality, Justin. Discussing the workarounds that are built into connect and um instead of focusing on uh, pulling together these um you know uh, more foundational fixes and and features and so i I'm, I'm afraid that in order to sort of preserve the view in the marketplace of connect which i understand the reasoning for doing so um, I fear we're going to end up uh, weakening the stances that this our eventual RFC will take. And it might just be the case that Connect is not OAuth 2.1 compliant, and it certainly isn't today. Um, so Connect 1.0 might not be, and that's okay. It's not for this spec to say how to use Connect. OK. 
Okay. Anybody Anybody else? Else? Disrupt right. the marketplace as little as possible. We have recognized that the connect profile of OAuth 2 solves many of the problems already, and we're not recommending resolving them in a duplicative way. That's as it should be. I actually uh, disagree with that. I think that it's useful to sort of backport many of these solutions into the core such that extensions profiles of OAuth 2 that are not OpenID Connect also benefit from them. So yeah, Aaron, if, if it wasn't clear, uh, I don't actually disagree with that at all. Um, yeah. Having edited a number of backports <laughs> that do exactly that for this working group. But anyway, on the on this issue, it sounds like uh, we do not have the consensus to merge this in currently, but a path forward is to uh, revisit this after that draft uh, gets RFC status. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, we we could do that. Uh, like uh, that that draft should be progressing soon. This might take some time, so maybe. We will revisit this later on, right? So I will put this on the queue for likely the next interim session about 2.1 then. Yep. Yep. Do that. Okay. Uh, okay. Moving on to next, next issue. Um, this issue is, um, requiring HTTPS redirect URLs. So currently the draft says the redirect URL for clients should require TLS. And if it's not available, it actually says the authorization server should warn the resource owner about the insecure endpoint. Um, that is language from OAuth 2.0. The, I believe the reason for the, for the not actually requiring TLS in the first place was that Historically, it was difficult to deploy, um, and that is just not really true anymore. Things have come a long way in 10 years. So the, um, I also suspect that there are very few authorization servers that actually follow this, this recommendation about warning about insecure redirect URLs anyway. Um, so the proposal is to actually make TLS a requirement for the redirect URL with, of course, exceptions for loopback interfaces and custom URL schemes. Uh, Justin is in the queue. No, that was previously. Yeah, that previous. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you see I sat down? <laughs> but but while while I'm here, I I, I think that this makes sense. I, I believe this is was kind of the intention of the should but other options language anyway. So this would just be must with other options. No. Okay. There's plus one from Brian. Okay. Anybody else has any thoughts on this? Any objections, I guess. <laughs> Okay, seems seems you're good here, Aaron. Great. Okay, um, good because that saves time for the next one, which is likely going to be a bit more of a discussion. Okay. Um, so this um, this issue ninety two. Let me uh, drop that in the chat so we know where the queue starts for this. Um, issue ninety two is a sort of uh, it, it is a meta issue that collapsed the, the rules of a bunch of other issues. So there were a bunch of other issues filed throughout the um, feedback that we got from both Justin and Vittorio and others um, on, on the spec. And um, there's a lot of things in the draft that are um, mitigations that are, because Pixie doesn't exist in the core, you have to do all the other things like um, making authorization codes, single use, um, that redirect URL in the token request is actually, there's language in the core draft that's, that suggests that that 
prevents um, kinds of mix-up attacks. And all of these things are solved better by Pixie. So once we have Pixie in place, many of these things just become not necessary and they don't really add anything. Uh, they don't even solve the proposed, the, the um, attacks they mentioned completely. They were just sort of additional layers. So um, basically the sort of, as we were going through these, we realized that, well, we could actually solve a lot of this stuff if we could drop the, the relatively complex requirements on authorization codes uh, replay mitigations in favor of Pixie. Um, some of these are also rather burdensome to implement, um, like single use authorization codes, which I know for a fact that some implementations actually do not enforce this, even though it is recommended. So this would be, um, yeah, this is the proposal. Okay. Uh, I see Philip in the queue. I love Thank you. A quick question. Um... The proposal is to drop these requirements, however, existing software that would still continue doing so, like sending the redirect theory in a token request, authorization servers, invalidating codes and tokens um, after replay would still be allowed, but there would be no yeah. language for this. Yes, exactly. It's not going to prohibit uh, authorization servers from enforcing these extra things, um, but it wouldn't be suggested. Right. So for 65 and 82, that's the uh, invalidation. That's probably okay. But I would expect a language around redirect URI when it is actually present and it doesn't match the original one. Mm, okay. So basically mm, making me... it not a required parameter, but mentioning that if it is sent, then it should be enforced. I understand that it yeah. probably doesn't add value at all, but if it is present and it is a wrong value, then I would not be okay just ignoring it. Okay. Brian? I agree generally with the simplification of removing the redirect URI bit, but there, I, there's a potential for that to be a breaking change. So I just want to make sure we go into that eyes wide open and maybe even Note it in the document, which would be it's required if redirect URI is sent in the initial request currently in, uh, you know, base OAuth. So removing this here would would mean that clients, if clients, uh, what am I trying to say? Under those conditions, when clients stop sending it, uh, a 2.0 compliant authorization server requiring it would then not interoperate with a client not sending it. Um, ugh, it's hard to explain. I, I, I think the simplification is maybe worth it, but there's there is a case where this this is sort of breaking compatibility. I think we should just be aware. Um, but in general, I agree between Pixie and exact redirect URI matching, this is really redundant. Um, it doesn't add anything and it's it's a it's definitely been a, a problematic one to implement. So, uh, Brian, to I mean, we for sure don't want to break backward compatibility. That's that's an important part of two dollars. Yeah. And so we could have it. What if we phrase it that the AS may require it, right? And then if it is required, then the client must send it. Um. That would break interoperability. I mean, either it's required by every AS or it's not. Yeah, it, it's required under certain conditions now, and removing it would then an AS that continues the requirement from it would 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 break. Um, I'm not I'm not sure how to do that without that introducing that break. Um, but I. I I still think it's probably a good change to make. I just just wanted to note the condition. Um, I mean, from an implementation standpoint, it would probably come down to needing to conditionalize the requirement on redirect URI um, either on the version, which is not a great indicator of, or or on the presence of Pixie. 
and just thinking out loud. Um, so thinking out loud as well, maybe we should have it that the client still must send it, but that we can make checking it be optional by the AS, and then that would a uh, that that would certainly work. But I I think that maybe removes the that undermines the value of the simplification. Uh, no, because I mean, it, it's easy enough for the client to send it. the The hard part, you know, the the checking it at the other side was. The hard part, right? How did you come to how did you come to the conclusion? Which one? That it's hard? Wait. That it's easy for the client. Uh because the client's got it. Um it, it's actually maybe problematic for the client because the client either has to remember where it asked for it, or actually really it's supposed to normalize and send where it received the code. Um, right, but clients do it today, right? It's required today. Under certain conditions. And it and it's sort of a pain, I okay. guess. But in my mind, at least reading this, the getting rid of it entirely was was sort of the value of of it. Maybe I'm wrong, Aaron. Um No, no, I, I agree. <laughs> and I agree that it's not something that's just that's, that's assumed to be easy for clients to do. Um because sometimes they're configured to not even like know the host name they're running at, right? Yeah, it get, there's a bunch of weird oddities. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I would and I would like to point out that the security PCP already mentioned this option to just drop to redirect UI, the actual redirect UI, because a lot of implementations even don't support it. So it was never really a security countermeasure. And I think we're, we have that breaking change definitely. But we also have to be with regard to Pixie. I mean, a um, client must send a code challenge, even if it did not before when it used OAuth 2. So we have to face that problem. I mean, we are introducing breaking changes, and let's talk about how we manage those changes. Let me give uh, Justin a chance to chime in here. Justin? Yeah, thanks. So this is um, this is bringing back a topic that that I brought up at the very beginning of our discussions on two point one, um, and that's that our notion of uh, breaking and non breaking changes uh, that are supported in two point one need to be contextualized uh, by who it breaks for and under what circumstances. And so fundamentally, we've got we you end up with a matrix of say you've got a 2.0 client talking to a 2.1 server and a 2.1 client talking to a 2.0 server. If we make these changes, which of those break under which circumstances and which ones do we need to talk about? Right. And so some of those are going to be fine. Some of those are not going to be fine. Uh, specifically, if we have a 2.0 client talking to a 2.1 server, we would expect that to break because a 2.0 client that's not running all these extensions isn't going to be doing Pixie and all of these other things that are now required. Uh, so that is an expected break. If we have a 2.0 uh, or a 2.1 client, anyway. One of those. I've gotten myself confused without having the, the table written out in front of me. Uh, a, the point being, uh, there is a table uh, that we need to bin each of these changes into to uh, understand exactly what we want to accept in terms of breaking changes. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, Hannes. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, someone mentioned it earlier that uh, that this is um, a somewhat uh, unusual way of uh, versioning that we are using here because traditionally in in protocols, uh, if we had a, um, a sort of a bump in a minor version number, which is what we currently have, you are actually not allowed to make any uh, breaking changes whatsoever. Um, clearly, we are past that point. Um, with Pixie and and uh, various other things that we talked about before, so the question is, um, and this was something we talked about initially, because uh, we were wondering like what uh, what should the version uh, number be? What are we allowed to do and what not? Um, 
and so it's probably something to keep in mind that of course we have a lot of freedom on what we can do and it, but it, but it needs to make uh, sense in a in a in a bigger context we can't say oh we make all these breaking changes but then still call it a, a minor version change in my opinion yeah brian is there an official ietf version number policy <laughs> i wouldn't assume we're following Semver everywhere yeah I, I'm not aware of any document. Is there? Do, do you know? Um, I, I don't. I have to look it up, but uh, um, I have to look it up. Uh, it, it is a slippery slope, but um, but I see that topic coming up in 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 a number of uh, sort of organizations, not just the IETF on on what version changes uh, are acceptable acceptable and what not. Um, but uh, yeah. I will look it up, what it is, something. Well, just important. DLS that. is probably not a good example. <laughs> Apparently, DLS didn't uh, didn't quite follow that notion. Um, yeah. OK. Um, OK, Aaron, so uh, anything else on this? Uh, um, well, one other thing that I realized uh, as we were discussing the redirect URI issue, um, currently, the redirect URI is not a required parameter in the token request. It's only required if the authorization request contains a redirect URI, which is also not a requirement. And I have a feeling that um, there's a lot of implementations of OAuth servers that treat it as a required parameter always, which is actually not even correct according to OAuth 2. So I do feel like this is an opportunity to even get clarity in that uh, in that issue by just sort of dropping it completely. Including on the authorization request? Well, it would only be required in the authorization request if there's more than one configured for the client, yes, which is yes, where agreed. it's currently and then, required. And then in turn, that situation requires it on the token request. Well, it wouldn't under this proposal. Under this, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think it's the right thing to do. I just wanted to note that that there is potentially that there is potentially a break there, and maybe that I don't know how to best handle it. Should be called out somewhere due to change. Yeah, I agree that it's potentially a break, and I think it's um, it's probably worth calling out the specific case that you described. But I wanted to point out that um. I think that many of the sort of breaks are actually would be considered uh, those servers are already not compliant with OAuth two is what Great. my point is there. That's possible. Uh, suggest maybe we should have a section on how two dot one is different than two dot and what might be breaking, so it's all in one spot for someone to look at that reading the document. Yeah, we have the section ten for that, but it could probably go into more detail on right. those things. Um, I will note. note yeah, I, I, Aaron, I would recommend, as I have done in the past, to uh, contextualize the text in section ten based on who it's breaking for, because mm -hmm. uh, I really think developers uh, looking at two dot one are going to want to know what they need to change for their clients and what they need to change for their ASs. Yeah, fair point. And this one, to go back on Justin's sort of classification, the break here, as I see it, would be a 2.1 client trying to interoperate with a 2.0 server that also does Pixie, um, just because that's how it's developed and been over time, which I think is a fairly common case. So that would be, that's where in the matrix this one would break under the conditions that the client has more than one redirect URL. Right, and to Brian's point, I think we're okay with that. I think we're okay with it too. It's just, we need to make sure that that's where in the matrix it goes. That's why I yeah. keep recommending that matrix and categorizing everything in here that's enumerated in section 10, like that. Uh, 
I think it's a great idea to document these explicitly um, in, in that section. Um, okay, so in that case, it sounds like we generally agree that these are uh, good recommendations on the slide here. Um, and as long as they're properly documented, can go ahead with this. Any any objections? Oh, I, I, I want to come back to the uh, version discussion because I had to think about Brian, Brian mentioning the DLS example, and I think it, this is interesting because um, DLS has this version negotiation, so. Uh, there is a possibility to actually fall back to an earlier version. So a version 1.2 server, um, when it's contacted by uh, a dual stack 1.2, 1.3 server, can basically negotiate the new the version it, uh, or the common version. And uh, so there changes um, are not the no issue, but uh, they are less of an issue because um, unless you have some policy uh, that requires you to always use the latest version. But um, I think our case is slightly different because um, because as, as some of you said, there are these different changes that impact um, the different roles differently, the different parties in this whole uh, ecosystem. So um, having some text as, uh, I think Aaron or Dick uh, mentioned um, to describe on what the changes are and who they impact uh, most is probably, uh, or it's not probably, is certainly a good thing to do to keep, to keep the developers informed. So that's uh, that's definitely a minimum um, we should be doing. Yeah. Today, you know, you know, do I have an OAuth server that? To server that supports Pixie or not, right? Like there's this like scattering of features and stuff may or may not work together depending on whether a feature is implemented. An advantage of calling it 2.1 is that you know that it does have Pixie, both as a client and as a server. Right. Okay. Anything else, say Aaron, on this? Nope, that's all I had, and this is my last, my last right. item. Okay, but that's that's pretty good, uh, Aaron and and Dick, um, and Dawson. Um, to me, it sounds like we are getting close to completion, like uh, minus the one of the issues we discussed earlier. Um, so un unless or. I, are there other issues that you didn't put up in the slide deck, uh, which are minor, or is that all we know of? Um, there are a handful of other minor things um, that we're still working through, and um, hopefully enough of them are sort of mostly editorial and, and um, you know, just requires doing the work to, to write the text. Um, there uh, was one topic that's been been being discussed on the mailing list that uh, I didn't pull into this because it sort of came up right before this session, um, which does sound like something worth clarifying more. And I think we can continue that on the on the list for now. But that is the definition and uh, explanation of the implications of the different client types. Yeah. So I think there's mm -hmm. still more work to do there to clarify that. Um, but didn't I didn't feel like we I didn't want to try to cram into this session because the mailing list discussion has been um, useful so far. Yeah. Um, so um, like uh, looking forward, what do you expect is a, is a useful completion date uh, for this work? It sounds like to me, like from what you just said, it's uh, maybe we are talking about Q1 uh, next year, right? It wouldn't be too, um, do outrages. I think that's fair because um, we're going to have, um, I would say at, at the next interim, we will um, hopefully have a, a 
small list of things to discuss and can um, yeah, hopefully have the next have the remaining issues uh, whittled down by then. Okay. Victoria. Um, I, I agree that the, the progress is fantastic, really, really nice. There is a one area of uh, the feedback that I provided, which was uh, largely about uh, the distinction between mobile clients and desktop clients and uh, some of the guidance uh, that is in the native uh, client uh, uh, BCP, which has been uh, uh, added verbatim to, to that one, which uh, uh, I think that there, there were a number of things that I found uh, controversial and I know are controversial in the market, like uh, use of ports uh, and uh, or use of system browser also on desktop where there are no APIs for doing it. So. Uh, I guess that I was just expecting that you guys were going through the huge pile of feedback we gave you, but once you get to that part, I would expect at least some discussion. Yep, totally fair. Like I said, the um, sections eight and above uh, are where we're still going through that. So um, basically what I've been doing is, uh, the way I've been processing this is going through all the points in both your and Justin's emails and um, when it has been a simple, non-controversial suggestion to add or, or do, then just doing that change um, in line. And if it requires discussion or additional um, work to, to Wordsmith, then I've been filing it as an issue on GitHub to track it uh, there. And then that's where these filter into these sessions. Um, but the yeah, the uh, I have not yet got to section eight. So once um, once I get to that point, you are absolutely correct that some of those will um, filter up into discussion points. So um, hopefully we can have some of those discussions asynchronously um, and not have to wait for the next um, face to face uh, or synchronous call. Um, but yeah, definitely will want to talk about any of those that are more sensitive or controversial. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else has any, or maybe Aaron, any, anything else from your slides first? Nope. That's it for, for me. Anybody else that has any comments, questions? Okay. Awesome. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Great, thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys.